everyone to co-produce CARE's hashtag Care Uncut. Um, that doesn't roll off very smoothly off the tongue, I'm sorry. I can, can never get that right. Um, but I'm really looking forward tonight to be talking about the National Care Service. Not here, don't get too excited, not in the, not in England, but in Scotland, because they are slightly ahead of us um, in that uh, sense. And I just thought, we all thought at Co-Produce Care, it'd be a really good idea to start getting those discussions and lessons learnt around what's going on in Scotland, could we learn lessons from how they're doing a consultation um, and implementing it in Scotland? So as always, do put your comments in the chat. Do remember to like, if you like this video, we'll do more of these type of things. Um, we really are here to get a gauge of what people are interested in and we will respond to that and get as many fantastic speakers on as we can. Um, so as a way of a slight introduction, um, as I said, we're going to be talking about the National Care Service. And as some of you may or may not know, it was around the 7th of September that Nicola Sturgeon outlined plans for the establishment of a National Care Service as part of her government's plans for the following year. So the First Minister said the new service would arguably be the most significant public service reform since the creation of the National Health Service following World War II, and she confirmed the Scottish government would increase funding for social care by at least 800 million. So the consultation is happening at the moment, and um, we want to discuss some of the issues and questions with two expert speakers. Uh, so I'm delighted to have with us today, uh, Colin Turbot, who's author and social worker in the West of Scotland. Um, and he's been doing that for nearly 40 years. And he's written an article for The Common Wheel, which if you Google that, you can find it. Um, and that's a think tank about some of the issues around developing a national care service in Scotland. Uh, and also we'll be joined by Henry Anderson, who's a reporter for healthandcare.scot. So that's actually the URL, so you can check them out. Uh, and he's covered the announcements of the new service in Scotland's online health and care news channel, as well as, well as many of the conversations around it. So I haven't done a huge amount of prep for this session, so I'm actually going to be learning with the rest of you. Um, so I'm just going to show a bit of a clip, um, just introducing this, uh, the National Care Service in Scotland, um, just to give it some context, and then we will head on over to talk to Henry. So um, let's listen to this. I can confirm that we will introduce uh, in this parliamentary year a National Care Service Bill. This will provide for the establishment of the new service, which we intend to be operational by the end of the parliament and implement what is arguably the most significant public service reform since the creation of the National Health Service. Alongside reform, there will also be investment. I can confirm that we will increase funding for social care by at least £800 million, 25% over the lifetime of the Parliament. We will also remove charges for non-residential care, and we will introduce Anne's Law, giving nominated relatives or friends the same access rights to care homes as staff. Presiding officer, I know that the establishment of the National Care Service will spark much debate and it is vital that we get the detail of it right. But done well as we intend, a National Care Service will be one of the biggest ever achievements of this Parliament. And just like the National Health Service in the wake of the Second World War, it will be a fitting legacy from the trauma of COVID. Well, wow, that's an amazing promise. Um, and before we do head on over to Henry, I'm just going to have a couple of asks, as I always do. Do please like this video. And um, if you have any ideas, even if you want to say I'm for or I'm against the idea of a national care service, then put your comments in. It would actually be really interesting to hear what you think of the idea right now and then revisit your comments later on at the end of the live stream um so do feel free to to get on commenting and we will be looking at that as well so um whilst you're all getting on to that i'm going to introduce henry anderson hello hello. hello thank you for having me uh oh that was that was a good introduction so i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to follow on from that um but yeah i'm gonna talk briefly about the, the sort of genesis of the National Care Service in Scotland um, and how that, what that means really, but also quite importantly, what that is not going to be. 
um, no matter what the name suggests. Um, so, I mean, as you, you you've kind of highlighted, the the start of this was it, it was announced in a uh, as a kind of response to the, the care home deaths during coronavirus. Um, and Nicola Sturgeon was talking about, um, obviously talking about you know the founding of the NHS. So it's that kind of idea. Um, but the initial commitment was was way back now in August or September 2020. So it was right after that first wave. Um, and there's probably a few uh, important things to note about the kind of situation in Scotland before they started this process. The first thing is that there is a degree of further entitlement to social care that there isn't in England. So free personal care, for example, um, there is a commitment to pay uh, care workers the Scottish living wage, which is think, £9.50 an hour at the moment. So they were sort of starting from a slightly different position to England. The other thing is that for about five years now, the NHS and social care, the NHS and councils have been required to integrate their services. Um, the jury is out as to whether that has worked well, but that's that's the backdrop essentially. Um, so, so Nicola Sturgeon's announced this uh, this care service, and I think it's important to say at the outset that it is not an NHS for social care. So you have the name, the National Care Service, but you know the the, the existing mix of providers um, will will continue. Uh, so. I was looking at the care home figures and around two, three quarters, sorry, of the care homes for adults are run by private sector. And you've got charitable providers and some local authorities. The uh, The mix is similar for care at home, uh, but the um, the private sector is, is slightly smaller. You have more third sector providers. But, but basically this review process said we're not going to touch that. They, they looked at nationalising care. Um, and they decided essentially it was too expensive. So they shied away from that. And um, so what you have is, is a, a new body, the National Care Service, that will oversee the existing mix of providers. And the idea is that this will come with higher standards, better paying conditions. And um, there's a lot of criticism of this idea of a postcode lottery. Um, mm -hmm. So one particularly controversial aspect of the changes is to take the power to organise care away from councils. So there's 32 local authorities in Scotland, so they will no longer have a role in commissioning care, so organising people's care and paying for it. They will still provide some care, but the actual responsibility uh, for who for who commissions that care will move to the National Care Service. Um, so I think Nicola Sturgeon has said it's, it's going to be up and running by the end of this parliament, so that takes us to 2026. Um, it's still a work in progress. I mean, the, the important thing, there was a review process. The uh, review was headed by a former chief executive of the NHS in Scotland, uh, Derek Feely. Uh, that review was pretty well received, I think, by uh, most people feeding into it. They felt that Derek Feely had uh, taken on account of the views of people with lived experience. Now we've moved to a slightly different phase where the government is, is setting out its own plans for the National Care Service. And slightly controversially, they've actually gone beyond what the review recommended. Uh, the review recommended that this national care service would bring together adult social care and some elements of the NHS. Uh, the, the Scottish government has decided that it's, it's going to include most basically healthcare outside of hospital. Uh, it's also going to include children's social care, uh, alcohol and drug services. <coughs> various other services but but all this is currently out for consultation um in the scottish parliament uh, so anyone can actually uh, feed into the process i believe i believe the consultation closes at the start of november so it, it is very much in development and um, we are waiting to see how it pans out um, so hopefully hopefully that will say a kind of overview and i'm sure we'll get into uh, some of the the kind of service sorry i unceremoniously removed you from the stream for a second oh, there okay. um yeah no that was really fantastic um and it was a great overview and i learned a lot from that and i'm hoping that a few of our listeners did as well and if you did do feel free to like the stream um I was really interested, actually, your point on the fact that it's not going to be uh, the same version, like uh, basically an NHS for care. Um, mm. But it's, I feel 
over here in England, we very much feel mm -hmm. like that's what a national care service would mean, that it's going to, everything's going to be nationalised. Um, and so there won't be so much of a private sector. Can you unpick sort of why it, that why it's called a national care service then, if it's not effectively a national care service? <laughs> Yeah, um, and to be honest, I think that the simplest answer is probably just politics. Um, the, the interesting thing was that during the, uh, so after the first wave, during the first wave of the pandemic you had, there was a sort of quite a big push. Um, it was an anti kind of private care sentiment um, driven by the deaths in care homes. And you had people, it was sort of the Labour Party and the unions, people on the left of the SNP, the Scottish National Party, calling for a national care service and a national care service in their eyes was was removing profit from the care system um and what nicola sturgeon announced i mean so they announced a review process to come up with ideas for a national care service um and that review process sort of i don't think many people believe that they were going to recommend that they should buy out the kind of private care homes and the home care agencies um so this re the review process sort of went along and looked at the costings and it was basically way too expensive um so that's how you get to the, the current situation so so i think it is really political right okay that's really interesting um i've noticed we've just been joined by colin so i would love to bring him in um to discuss the rest of the themes that we want to discuss this this evening so i'm going to just take you out for a moment henry but thank you hold fire we will bring you back in um but that was really really interesting so um hello colin how are you Hi this there. evening fine great um, sorry some techie problems with joining you but here now you're here now and that's all that matters um so i'm really excited to um Hear your views on this a little bit but before we do that can you just talk a bit about yourself your journey um, and your initial thoughts on the Nas national care service in scotland yeah okay i'm uh colin Turbot. i'm was a social worker for for almost 40 years uh, and a frontline team manager so um over the last 10 years or so of of my work i started writing and um, I produced a couple of books, including one called Radical Social Work, which really sums up my experience over that long period and my hope for uh, social, worker, social work being much better than it actually was. And since I retired a few years ago, I've continued to um, do whatever I could to promote uh, good social work, radical social work, community social work, with anybody like you that will have me. And I'm really pleased to be here. And uh, for the last year now, I've been a member of the uh, Scottish Commonweal um, think tank care reform working group. Uh, we're all volunteers, we're all quite experienced. So um, we've had a great deal to say about the Feely report. We started our work before Feely was published and we've got a great deal to say about the National Care Service and uh, not much of it good, unfortunately. Um, we feel that it uh, fails to meet aspirations generally. Uh, it doesn't meet its promise. Um, we're not that surprised at that because for us, it didn't really start from the right place. I've recognised for a long time, as have many colleagues in Scotland, that social work and social care were broken. That didn't start last year when we had that catastrophic le uh, level of deaths in care homes. It was broken long before that. And some of us have been pushing to find solutions that that um, that whole process started in the 1990s with the fracturing of social work and the introduction of the market into social care, the kind of formalised introduction, if you like, and the over-proceduralisation of social work generally and its marginalisation into a role that was concerned more with risk assessment um, 
uh, and and protection of the so-called protection of the vulnerable and identifying them than with a general welfare role which 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 was promised through the 1968 social work scotland act no accident that act was passed in 1968 it was a revolutionary year um, if you remember, all sorts of things happened then, and it seemed to chime with the times and promised a future that sadly never happened. So the, the knee-jerk reaction to the care home deaths last year, which led to the Feely report and has led to these proposals, has all been put together far too quickly without any consideration about core principles and and the, even even indeed the meaning of care. So it's incoherent uh, and very poorly structured and the yeah. proposals themselves are really pretty poor. Okay, so um, all doom and gloom or is it? No, not entirely doom and gloom. No, I mean, we certainly welcome the idea of a national care service. Unfortunately, this isn't it. Um, we certainly welcome the idea of it being cradle to grave and children's services and justice services and so on being brought in alongside adult care. that That's a step forward from the Feely report, but unfortunately enacted in a way that suggests it's just been bolted on yeah. rather than thought through properly. Just for our listeners who aren't very familiar with it, can you just explain what the Feely report is? Yeah, Fe the Feely report was um, commissioned by Scottish government uh, in the summer of 2020, with a fairly short turnaround time to report on the future of social care, bearing in mind that there'd been that level of um, that catastrophe, and it really was, I mean, of, of about half the deaths from COVID up until the summer of this year were in care homes, and care homes only represent less than 1% of the population. So that that really was absolutely appalling. And much of that was based on um, policies that were perhaps unintentionally carried out, but nonetheless led directly to the deaths of people, sending them out of hospital without having been tested uh, for COVID, for instance, not supplying sufficient quantities of PPE, etc. Um, to social care homes. So they were completely in the dark at the start about what they were dealing with. And that was, I think, characterised absolutely wonderfully uh, in the, the the TV play um, that was on a few weeks ago. What was it called? Help? Help, it was yeah. Yeah, think, yeah, yeah, very, very good. Um, really helpful. Thank you for that, um, Colin. I'm just going to add Henry back in. Um, because we had a few things we thought would be useful to, to go over. Um, and if anyone does have any um, comments, I will check Twitter in a second, then do um, do make sure you leave them in the chat. Um, uh, but for now, just, I mean, Henry, I think you might have touched on some of this already, but mm. in terms of understanding what you're doing at the moment, um, in terms of this, this National Care Service, what's proposed, how will funding change under the new system? Um, and maybe we can also touch on eligibility. Yeah, um, well, I guess it, in one sense, it's, it's difficult to say because it hasn't come in. The, the government has promised, as you've said, this is 800 million by the end of the parliament, which I think, I think is about 20% increase on the current levels of spending. Um, th there is, the problem is that they're probably already past the initial estimates of how much it's going to cost um, in terms of what they've decided to do. Uh, the thing that's really expensive is not the national care service, the body, it's it's in enhancing eligibility and it's essentially paying care staff more. That, they're the two expensive parts of the, the plant. Um, and and th the problem is that in the past, so Scotland introduced free personal care, now, the government's funding for that policy never really kept pace with the demand for it. So what ended up happening was that councils started restricting access to it. Um, so th with the care service, it's kind, of, it's kind of too soon to say that the government has promised that they will fund the, the, you know, the recommendations of this Feely review. They will fund setting up a care service. But the key question will be whether that funding kind of matches 
the, the demand as it grows. Um, and the final, the kind of final point to make on this is that, that there's not really been a discussion around paying for this, this funding. Um, I mean, I don't know what, what, what kind of listeners know, but the Scottish government doesn't raise much money itself. It comes from Westminster and they can sort of raise income tax if they choose to. They haven't really had a discussion about how they're going to pay for this. Um, they, they seem quite happy to avoid that for now. That's really interesting. Colin, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, 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 absolutely. I think the when Johnson announced, announced a few weeks ago in, in his autumn budget, um, uh, really what amounts to a windfall for Scotland, uh, you know, an extra 1.1 billion um, for health and social care. Our concern is, and that, you know, that will in some senses rescue the plans that they've got. Uh, and, and Henry's right, they're not, you know, it's not been thought through how they'll be funded. But the problem with this is that, that one of the the, the things underlying the proposals is that they continue the model of integration between health and social care. And, and nobody seems prepared in government to challenge that uh, and, and suggest, as the Audit Commission did a couple of years ago, that it's actually not working. And many people within the social work profession know that it's not working, that if you join um, a little, you know, something that's quite small um, relatively with something that's very big, the bigger organisation will always dominate and will always get the lion's share of the funds and, and have the lion's share of the influence. And that model will continue. So our worry is that a lot of that extra 1.1 billion um, that's been promised through the Barnet, Barnet formula with the national insurance increase, which isn't good, by the way. That's a, a very regressive way to raise tax. But a lot of that will finish up with health um, through, through this national care service proposal. It won't actually go to social care at all. And that's part of the problem, that the integration model in itself is absolutely fraught with problems. And, and our view is that we should go back where we were before with a separation between health and social work and social care. They're different functions and, and cooperation with it between them should be undertaken at frontline level. And I've experienced that in my career. We actually got on much better at frontline level when we were different organizations. And the minute they started to join us together with protocols made at, at, at top level, it all became unstuck and became fraught with difficulties. But then the voice of experience doesn't really count much in this. Um, so my colleague Arnie has popped that up for a reason. We'll pop that up back up again, Arnie. So Ministerial Power and Integrated Systems, Health and Social mm. Uh, by another name. Um, so I think that's just supporting some of, of what you're saying there. Um, thank you for that. Uh, You've mentioned before, Colin, about it not starting from the right place in terms of you think that it should start from principles. Um, can you explain why that you think that's so important? Yeah, yeah. When it's something we're working on, um, in, in Commonweal, we've had to respond to Feely and then to the, the proposals and, do, and cobble together what we can, given the horribly prescriptive nature of the questions in the consultation, a, a response. But we're also working on a blueprint for a national care service, a real one, and one that's not just that in name. And, and that would be based, first of all, on a definition of what care is and how important it is in society that care is something that we all thrive on or don't thrive on if it's lacking. And you start from that, you start from an acceptance that care is something that we all almost take for granted. It's there in families or it should be there. When there's a deficit in care, then the state should step in um, and start to substitute from that. And that's where a national care service, a cradle to grave one comes in starting with the lowest level forms of advice and assistance through to actually providing a home for people and the support they need if they can't support themselves. Um, and, and from that care, you can begin to look at core principles, one being universality, 
which I've referred to, cradle to the grave. Uh, another being the minimum level of intervention required, not over proceduralized and over intrusive, which certainly child protection can be if we're looking at that service as part of a national care service, which we are in Scotland. Um, one that's based on uh, being free at the point of need. Now, I know Henry was touching on that just as I came in um, to the broadcast, but but the idea that it's unaffordable, we find hard to accept. If, we, if we're serious enough about providing a care service that's equal to the National Health Service, then we should be looking at ways to fund it properly and not just reframing or, or rebranding what we're already doing and calling it a national care service. So it should be free at the point of need. Um, and, and that means doing away with the private sector in its entirety. Why on earth should um, profits from social care, which make up 80% of the sector in Scotland, uh, are in private hands, why should profits from that end up in the Cayman Islands, in tax havens? It's absolutely, frankly, ridiculous. We wouldn't accept that uh, if, if hospitals were funded in that way, then profits from hospitals ended up uh, in tax havens. So why should we accept that a, a national care service should, should be second class? I mean, I could go on about core principles. It's something mm -hmm. we're working on at the moment, but I'll maybe... I'll maybe end stop there. Well, it's a really interesting point, and I'd be interested to see in the comments if anyone mm. thought exactly the same or any different. And you know, it's it's important to say that that is the the angle that your organisation and and you're coming from. Um, and I'd be interested to hear, um, Henry. I know that the consultation when I was sort of like researching about the consultation, there was a lot of um, carer groups, uh, a lot of people trying to get involved. And I don't know whether from you know your perspective you've what what are the opinions that you've seen that the people are sharing about the the national care service um i don't know if you've have been been to any of these groups at all uh, Henry. Yeah. Uh, yeah well i it's, it is an interesting one because um there is actually there is a, a degree i mean a lot of groups did, really did welcome the um the kind of broad ideas behind it, the sort of ideas contained within the National Care Service. Um, so to be honest, because I think a lot of people's negative experiences of care were linked to their experience with the local council. And so therefore, there was a degree of support for this idea that you just take care away from the councils and you put it in the hands of something new. Now, you know, in, in fairness to them, the councils would say, well, it's because we, we don't get enough money from the government. Um, but that's the kind of perception that there is. You would see the same, I think, among quite a lot of people in the sort of independent living movement um, who, again, they see the councils as sort of acting as gatekeepers to social care. Um, and I, I think it, it's worth pointing out that a lot of the providers and, and, and that this is true of sort of third sector and private sector are actually again, they're supportive of this move away from councils because they they have they see the whole process of commissioning care as basically based on you know time and task 15 minute slots for home visits um basically trying to save you know do care as cheaply as possible so um there is a there's a degree of support for this kind of resetting of how care is is organized and bought and procured essentially that's really interesting um and i wonder you know, how, how long is left on the consultation? Is there more time for people to get involved and put there? Yeah, I believe it's, well, I believe it's maybe 10, this is the start of November, 4th or 2nd of November. Okay, so there's not much time for it to go. Yeah. Um, and I, do, I, oh, there we are. Thank you for that, Arnie. Um, so there you, there's, there's the information if anyone is in Scotland and they want to take part in, in that. Um, but it would be interesting to see how what comes out on the other end, I suppose, um, and and how things go um, and what it looks like. I think it's just really interesting that you said it very much looks like a national, it's badged as a national uh, care service, but actually it's, it seems to be really, when you look at the detail, it's very different. Um, 
and on here are some of the themes the consultation improving care quality using data in social care which is another interesting point um reforming integrated job joint board boards health social okay fair enough regulation standards uh commissioning services and market oversight valuing people who work in social care um workforce planning personal assistance um and i wonder also from your point of view colin carers um they they've been getting involved in a lot of these debates as well what are you hearing from that group yeah i mean i'd echo what henry says the sad fact is that um as far as we can see, people are queuing up to to um, slag off councils and say they want out, and I, which I think is is terribly unfair on councils, and they're far from perfect. And I spent much of my career as a trade union rep fighting them for better services and, and better treatment of staff. So I know all about the imperfections of councils, but that's where democracy and accountability should start from from locally elected people who who you know who you can meet and if if it needs um tightening up and improving then we should look at that but to make the whole thing accountable to a government minister i think is a move away from democracy and i think care the, the idea of setting up um this this much larger board with carer representatives uh, and represent lived experience representatives, I think will lead absolutely nowhere. I think probably like this consultation, the individualistic views that are likely to come forward through that process will cancel one another out and leave officials, just as they do now in integrated joint boards, to lead the way and do what they want. Um, and that's the way it, that's the way they function at the moment. The lay members on them who don't have a vote currently, um, uh, you know, might have a voice, but at the end of the day, it's officials that decide what's going on, and I think that will continue. Uh, but but now, any any kind of say that councils have, which is precious little when it comes to adult care in Scotland, if you take that away, then you remove that democratic accountability. Not a good thing. Uh, so. In terms of if we in England were going to go down this route, um, the premise may be, I think most think it's potentially a good idea. What would be the things that you think we should be asking for? Because we haven't even had a consultation, but say if we were going to have a consultation, we were supposed to go to get in touch with our MPs and say, if we were going to have a national care service, this is where it should start. Um, are there any kind of lessons learned that you can can both share? Can I come to go back to Colin and then uh, come to Henry? Yeah, I think you you start with a proper evaluation of where things have gone have gone wrong, and and then you sit that alongside a discussion about what kind of care service you want and what it's based on and what we actually mean by care. So you go back to basics. You don't rush it through and then just simply bolt things on and rearrange the deck chairs on, on, on the Titanic. And it does feel like that. You know, we're, we're in a sinking ship, quite honestly. Um, the social work and social care professions are not good ones to be in, and they're not good ones to get services from. So to, to simply um, just change things without looking at them fundamentally i think is wrong so if, if what i'd be saying to you and I, I it seems odd saying this because i think many of us felt that in scotland we probably had more opportunity to shape the direction of future services than you might have in england with a with a conservative government um but if if you are engaging in this process down there and i hope you do get the opportunity then start by asking whether integration has worked that would be my first question has really seriously has integration worked because it seems to be like the emperor's clothes that professionals all know that it hasn't if they work in social work and social and social work certainly social services um but but nobody's prepared to say that it's not a good idea because it doesn't sound cool to say that I don't want to work alongside colleagues in health. Of course we do. But to, to structure it in the way it has been simply means that health dominates. And the whole thing about bed blocking becomes the central focus rather than what we really mean by care. 
Exactly. Well, that's very interesting. Um, and I think it's that that is the important thing. I think some of the proposals that have been put through for integrating health and social care that have come through the Department of Health and Social Care um, is that mm. it's focusing on not overwhelming the NHS rather than creating a community that cares well for people. Um, and that's I think that's unashamedly what the government have been um badging it really without you know any uh, shame on it um but it does feel to come across really as as quite bad that we're not starting with care and people and social care but instead we're starting with a system um but yeah interesting henry any lessons learned any tips for us over in england what should we be asking for yeah i mean i think i think there's a, i think probably actually start with a, a positive um in that m most of the people I've spoken to um, through my work who engaged with the Feely review, so this is the review by Derek Feely that looked at setting up a national care service, were actually very, very pleasantly surprised about the scope and the extent of consultation. Um, so it might, maybe some of them didn't agree with the kind of recommendations, but um, they really engaged with disabled people's organizations, people with experience of care. Um, and for a lot of people um, in carers groups, et cetera, that was a real breath of fresh air. They hadn't seen that before from the government. I mean, the challenge is kind of converting that into something, you know, something down the line, but that would definitely be a positive is that involvement of people with experience of care through the process. And to be honest, if you, if you read the report, you'll see it has, you know, people's voices featured throughout um which is quite refreshing um i do think there is an issue about the, the amount the, the kind of how because if, if you think this is the biggest you know change since the creation of the nhs it has happened quite quickly so that's probably another one um to think about and my, my final thing i guess is just following on from what colin said I, i'm not so sure that I think the danger is now in Scotland, there's a big argument about whether setting up a body called the National Care Service is the right solution. Um, I suspect that what is actually more important is things like care charges and scrapping them and, you know, recruitment and paying conditions for care workers. So it's not to get distracted by arguing about the kind of organisation when what I would say is probably more important is the kind of generosity of the system uh, at large. So th this this care service is going to be able to guarantee, do you think, better pay conditions for um, care workers? Well, there'll, there'll be national collective bargaining uh, un under the proposals, which can only be a good thing. And I think that's been welcomed uh, by the trade unions so that that that's a step forward if we can achieve that. But as Henry was was detailing earlier, the amount of money that's been put in will hardly meet the aspirations of social care workers, many of whom are on minimum wage. And quite honestly, if we value them properly, we should just now be paying them £15 an hour, uh, not £8, whatever it is. And it's it's an absurd amount to, to value to place on the work that they do. So national collective bargaining, what does that mean in real in exam Let's give me some examples. Well, national collective bargaining is what we have in, in uh, what we did have in local government and we, we have in things like the civil service, whereby um, pay and conditions are negotiated nationally um, through in, in, by employer representatives with employee representatives, usually trade unions. Uh, and that, of course, encourages trade union membership amongst the social care workforce, which can only be a good thing because that's sadly lacking at the moment. It's very difficult for um, social care workers to join trade unions. Some employers actively discourage that, refuse to recognise trade unions and, and make it very, very difficult for their staff. Now, that would all end at a stroke if we had national collective bargaining. Uh, an encouragement through that of trade union membership. So that, that that's what we mean by collective national collective bargaining. Good thing. I mean, it's been broken down in local government um, and there's now kind of not sectoral bargaining, but bargaining 
by by local authority in Scotland, and that came about because of discussions around equal pay in the early two thousands. Failed to de failed to deal with the issue of equal pay, but um, I think we we probably need to review that. Well, that's really exciting. I mean, um, unions and understanding what, who they are, what they do and how they can help social care workers is something that we have been actively trying to start a conversation on on this channel. We've yeah. had two live streams with um, a few uh, unions. And um, so that I think that's actually quite huge if that happens, because... Mm -hmm. Uh, many times I say that people say that the workforce is very fragmented, that will obviously bring it together, that will obviously give it a lot more power to negotiate a better terms and conditions. Um, so I think that's that's a huge benefit, obviously, for that group of people. Um, staying on that theme, Henry, are there any other benefits that are being touted by, for, for care workers specifically that we've missed out? Yeah, I mean, it's less so uh, for sort of the, the kind of in the same way that wages are, but there is, there is a lot in the um, the kind of consultation about um, using this new national care service to kind of do those national things around training, uh, data collection, um, career progression that don't really happen in the same way that they do in the NHS because uh, there is no kind of national body to do that. Um, so th there is the prospect for that. And you know, in, in fairness to the government in, in Scotland, they do put additional money in to kind of top up the wage that care workers get. So it's, it's, it's by no means enough, but it's it's higher than kind of, I think what you'd see as typical wage levels in England. Um, so that there is a degree of, of commitment there. Um, but yeah, I think the other things are more around that kind of national workforce progression, career training, that kind of thing. Okay, and again, that's got to be a positive um, for care workers um colin did you want to chime in with anything else otherwise I yeah, want to, there, um, there, yeah just there are other huge workforce uncertainties in the proposals and that's to do with um the job that i used to do local authority social work it's by no means clear where social workers where social work will lie will social workers continue to be employed by councils um will they be transferred to the new national care service, um, and 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 be you know kind of like health workers are at the moment. All very very unclear in the proposals. Um, so what I'm hearing at the moment, and I don't know whether Henry has heard this, is that the, there's been so much angst about the way in which children's services and other social work services have been bolted onto this between Feely and the proposals coming out, that it may be that children's services will remain with local authorities. Now, the, the big problem with that, if that happens, is that it completely fractures social work. It, it, it then ceases to be a single entity in the way that it has been in Scotland since 1968 uh, and reverts back to being um, a, f a fractured workforce and you could finish up with different types of training and so on. So social work as a profession loses its identity. And I think it's it's probably no accident that the chief social work officers who are there to employ by each local authority to ensure that professional standards are there don't receive a single mention in the proposals, not a single mention. So it's almost like a dissing of their role uh, and a dissing of social work as a profession, which I find profoundly sad because I think this could have been an opportunity to say social work back to what it should be doing, which is providing a general welfare role in communities, rather a, a preventative role, rather than an upstream crisis driven role. Part of me well, most of me really, really wants this to work because I feel that um, if it doesn't work in Scotland, it might be an excuse to not even pursue it anywhere else. So part of me wants it to really, really work. Do you think that there's going to be a scope for people to just tweak around the edges of this and make it really great? I mean, I am disappointed that it, obviously in the video that I showed, it was, again, like I said, touted as going to be like an NHS when it's really nothing like that um but i do want to try and be positive about it um 
and so I suppose the thought is, you know, could through the consultation there be enough change for it to be quite a positive outcome in the end? Um, and then we do have a question from someone which I want to come come to afterwards, or, or a comment rather. But yeah, uh, do we th do you think that through this consultation at the end of it, um, yes, there's lots of holes in it at the moment that actually it could potentially even through once it's established through years of working on it that it could become more and more positive or if the proposals as they are just going to be so structurally wrong that it's if it's put through as it is at the moment it's just not going to hit the mark um Colin I'll, I'll, um, I'll come to you in a second but I'll, I'll go to Henry first yeah it's difficult I mean you know I do think there is there's some of the things that are in the kind of that the government has committed to are like significant like the idea of um abolishing all care charges for example like that is a big commitment um, that will make a difference to a lot of people. Um, it, it's, it's it, I guess, sort of trotting out the same line here, but I think a lot of it does just come down to how much money they, they're willing to, is, is what they're willing to pay for, essentially. Okay. There um, so we go. Yeah, and Colin? Yeah, I, I mean, it's interesting because after a, a webinar the other day, I tweeted that perhaps we should just scrap this and start again. And, and that was picked up by lots and lots of people. It clearly resonated with people within social work and carers uh, and disabled people as well who who felt that this that we're not getting off to a good start here. And I think we all welcome the idea of a national care service. All the political parties uh, in Scotland, I think, perhaps with the exception of the Tories, I'm not sure, but but the rest of them are all signed up to the idea of a national care service. We want it, we need it, but this is not the right start. So perhaps we should be, before this goes any further, um, and, and I kind of feel that the consultation, the responses to it may all cancel each other out. It will be such a mess that perhaps ministers will realise that they need to go back to the drawing board on this whole thing. And that would be very, very welcome. We want a national care service, but this isn't the basis for it. Really interesting. Um, and Ian's made a comment that uh, there's a lot of people who use care services who won't have access to an online consultation. Um, and their potentially their voices will be lost, uh, and and also said no to the backdoor privatisation. Uh, I mean that is potentially a real problem. Do you see that as a problem, Colin, in in your work that actually there are a lot of voices that are going to be left out from the consultation who will be affected by the change? Yeah, definitely, and 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 I think almost it's it's almost like a, a kind of reverse democracy here, because rather than use elected um, representatives, be they members of parliament or mem members of the Scottish Parliament or councillors, they've gone over their heads to consult directly with people online, um, and and they've done it, you know, hugely. It, I live in a tiny locality five and a half thousand people there are going to be two consultation sessions here if you live in northeast glasgow which has a population of a couple of hundred thousand you're you are also in a single locality with probably the same number of consultations so the whole thing is very uneven and as ian points out that excludes um people that are not social media savvy um, also, in Ian's point about backdoor privatisation, we just learned the other day, and Henry knows this because he, he reported on it, that the design for the National Care Service has been given to PricewaterhouseCooper. Can so I, um, then, you know, yeah. the, the experience and expertise that there is within the social care and social work workforce in Scotland has been ignored in favour of a private company with quite honestly, quite frankly, quite a dodgy reputation. Really good point. Brilliant segue, because I was going to come on to that um, lastly before before we close. And I'll come to Henry on that, because obviously that was something that you wrote about. I wasn't sure the significance of this. I thought, well, maybe they did that because PwC have expertise in doing these type of things. And there's no one else who might be user groups to to do that and maybe it's the scale um that's my ignorance about how these things are commissioned and, and who who can do them is that quite considered well first of all what what actually can you just go over the issue yeah. and, you know, its significance 
Yeah, and I'll start by saying that it was Colin's tweet that actually uh, alerted me to this. But, but, but basically, um, I mean, okay, so 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 PwC has been awarded a contract of, of I think, £100,000 to help the Scottish Government do the design of the uh, National Care Service. I think it's probably worth saying there's, there's a few things that, firstly, that, that is not a huge, that is a, quite a small amount in terms of these government contracts. Um, the second thing is that the government says that actually this is is not the actual design; it's kind of setting up a team to do the design. So that will be done in house. I think the problem they've got is that um, they're almost victims of their own uh, language about involving people with lived experience and service users. Um, and the story that I wrote that the government set up a panel of kind of real life experts uh, to advise them. And they sort of were, they really, someone who spoke to me really didn't like this then because um, they kind of saw that as just, you know, going to the same kind of same old uh, approach. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's kind of, I, I think the, vict- the the government in that sense is a sort of victim of their own kind of commitments. Um, and it speaks to this kind of wider unease about the National Care Service and how private providers fit into that and people's expectations of that. I, I think it's also a case of watch this space because m- my sources tell me that having won this contract, Pricewaterhouse Cooper are nicely lined up for the next phase of this, which will be worth about a million, um, far more lucrative um, for them. So this is just the beginning phase, but they've got a foot in the door. Um and, and, and it's all quite a complicated process, the way these things are tendered for. It's a kind of closed shop almost. Um, it's not something that's put out for, you know, I, I couldn't have tendered for it. Um, well, I, it had to be on a list. I think it's very familiar with what we've heard about other tendering processes mm-hmm. uh, that have happened over the pandemic. And maybe it's part of a group think that um, automatically governments are used to tendering and used to a certain group of people the kpmgs the deloitte the Mm -hmm. these type of organizations to do this type of work so it's almost not you know the thought of of going and doing it in a way that you're suggesting colin is is almost quite thought to them as quite out there and um a bit risky but i think it's good to challenge that's why it's good to challenge and and so your article on that henry um and your tweets colin obviously that started that uh, are all very useful um we've done really well actually i was going to suggest going over to twitter spaces for 10 minutes or so i don't know how you all are placed or what more we have to talk about on this but i'm sure we could find more um but for now we um are gonna close off and i just want to thank you both for coming on this evening because i have learned so much um and i'm absolutely going to be um setting my online sort of notifications on so i can hear what happens and any updates on this uh this uh consultation so thank you both very much um and um, we will um end the broadcast in a second and move over to to twitter spaces i'll take you out just now i want to give a couple of um updates and yes if people want to join us there and the great thing about spaces if you all didn't know is that you can actually vocalize we can hand the mic over to you and you can tell us what you think of these subjects as well so it's much more interactive with people who might be tuning in so we'll give it a go for um sort of 10 15 minutes or so in about five minutes but i'll say bye to our guests for now and just uh, do a few closing remarks Okay, so um, just a couple of things that I'm really looking forward to um, that are coming up. So if we just rewind back, a reminder that we did do some live streams on unions and you can go back on our YouTube or Facebook, wherever you're tuning in to us today and you can find those. Um, that's part one and part two with, with some other unions. Um, and also we are going to be doing a... Com- online conference it's exactly like we do these live streams so i am a bit nervous because it's all day it's on the 4th of november so um 
you don't need to write it down. All you need to do is subscribe and click the bell and you'll get notifications of when we go live. But it will be all day on, on the 4th of November, starting from about 10 o'clock. Um, and it's going to be on the subject of uh, we're using CQC's out of sight report as a talking point to start us off. And it's about restraint, segregation and seclusion in assessment and treatment units. So mental health hospitals. Um, a f it's very small on my screen, but you have got the guests there um, up, up there. And I mean, I have been following this for quite a long time. Um, I'm doing a PhD uh, loosely on this these subjects and I'm so grateful to have such fantastic guests um, joining us on the 4th of November. Uh, and I would really love it to be interactive again. I would love people to join in. There is a Eventbrite um, if you want to sign up. So you can put it in your diaries. Um, and if you go on to our, our website, you'll be able to find that. We've got it all over our Twitter as well. But very much encouraging people to get involved uh, because the speakers I, I've got on there are just incredible. Uh, we're going to be talking about different, different articles around decision making from the, uh, the UNCRPD, the Convention on the Rights for Persons with Disabilities. Um, and also we're going to be talking uh, with people with lived experience. We're going to be talking um, to academics and uh, it's going to be really comprehensive. So the team's done a great job putting that together. Very much encourage you to get involved. Sign, on the, sign up on the event right if you can. Um, and also uh, just just uh, subscribe to this and get onto our Twitter. So that's enough for me for now. Um, just a huge thank you to our guests. We're going to head over to Twitter now. Um, give us a minute or two and we will log on and start up a discussion on the subject of a Scottish National Care Service. Really want you to get involved with that conversation. Unmute your mic when you get onto Twitter. If you go on to our at CoproCare Twitter space, you'll be able to join in the conversation. Um, just give Twitter a couple of minutes to sign us, uh, sign you on to that. But it shouldn't, it's very, very easy. Go and check it out and try it. Okay, so thank you very much, everybody. Um, and we will be hopefully seeing you on Twitter shortly. Okay, take care, everyone. Bye-bye.